What is up, my friends? Today, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're gonna talk about swim baits, mega bass swim baits, maybe just swim baits in general, but you've heard me talk enough. Today, we're gonna pick the brain of my good friend, Oliver. What's up, dude? What's up, brother? Good welcome, to be back. Welcome to the Hookup Tackle. Thank you, man. Yeah, Thank it's been you. a while. It has been, yeah. been too long. It has. So today, Oliver stopped by, we're shooting the shit, and we decided, you know what, let's come and uh, let me pick his brain for you guys. See if we can learn some things, a different take perhaps, on some baits that we talk about a lot. So if you guys are ready, are you ready? I hope so. All right, here we go. Welcome to the Hookup Tackle. The Hookup Tackle is the world's largest showcase of Mega Bass products, featuring baits and colors not found at any other dealer. The Hookup also offers a wide display of OSP, Evergreen, Depths, Lucky Craft, Jackal, and many more. The Hookup Tackle is owned and operated by family, is staffed by guides and verified tackle nerds who love helping anglers elevate their craft. If you're in the Phoenix area, we'd love to have you stop by our showroom and check out the wonderful world of Mega Bass and the Hookup for yourself. If you shop online, there are almost 10,000 SKUs of Mega Bass products alone with hundreds of other companies and new products being added daily. So next time you're looking for that hard to find bait, that color your fish have never seen before, or maybe you just want to elevate your game, look at thehookuptackle.com. All right, welcome back, my friends. I am Ben with The Hookup Tackle, AKA The Tackle Talk you on Instagram, being joined by my buddy, Oliver Nye. What's up? So you so can guys. follow Oliver on Instagram, of course, Big Bass Dreams on Instagram as well. And of course, not to leave out our man with the plan, Jeffrey the King. What's up, Jeffrey the King? What's up, you two? So we're gonna talk about some swim baits today, Jeff. That's nice. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. I don't know anything about swim baits. So we know. That's why. I know you're why... really pumped to talk about finesse fishing and oh, spin dude. rods. Oh, okay. We'll do a drop shot episode later, and then we'll invite Griffin <laughs> for the Ned Rig <laughs> episode. So what's up, dude? Man, just uh, traveling east. Yep. About to kick off 2022. We've got our first event on the Kissimmee chain in Florida. Perfect. So coming from L.A. and California to the East Coast, you gotta stop at the hookup. Right on, dude. So you and Riley traveling through, you guys are both fishing the Opens this year? Yeah, funny yeah. story, she's actually confirmed for all the Southerns okay. and Northerns. All right. I'm actually on the outside looking in right now. I'm number 14 on the waiting list on the pro side. So maybe you're fishing, maybe you're not. Well, you're fishing, but maybe you're fishing, fishing the tournament. Right. Maybe you're not fishing the tournament. All uh, right. Well, so. Yeah, interesting in. little fold. I, I do too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's talk about that for a minute. So obviously I want to talk, I want to pick your brain on swim baits and share whatever info we can with the community. But let's talk about maybe a little bit of your transition. So, you know, sure. a lot of our customers know you, follow you. You know, you pretty much started as a big bait, you know, trophy bass kind of, you know, hunting mentality that has transitioned into a little more worldly approach and now taking some tournament stuff. So talk to me about that transition and what sure. happened and where you're at with fishing right now. Well, the problem with social media is the onset in the early 2010s didn't show you my whole backstory leading up to that point. When I started sharing what I was doing through social, at the time I was hyper-focused on big fish, big bites, those special moments and experiences that lead up to that, but you didn't see the, the decades of fundamental styles of fishing that actually set me up to have success with bigger applications. And now uh, I've reached a point in my fishing arc and fishing career, which is crazy as that sounds, to where I'm trying to maximize opportunities and bring those two worlds together uh, to, to make an impact in, in a context that kind of matters to me because I'm from a generation where when we grew up, you, you had a few options to make it in the fishing industry. You either worked in the industry, sales rep, in tackle shops, blah, 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 as a guide, which didn't appeal to me, or as a professional touring angler. A lot of my influence early was tournament-centric. So my pre-teens, my teens, even into my young 20s, uh, tournament fishing and culture and mentality was a big part of my, my fishing arc. And then I thankfully got to step away from that and focus solely on things that the king does. 
um, and, and target big fish with, with big lures. And, and man, I spent a lot of time doing it. Uh, but I see an ever-changing puzzle. Sure. Right, and that's the right. beauty of fishing and bass fishing in particular. And it doesn't really matter what level you're fishing at. You could be uh, battling griff on the on the shorelines one morning, or you could be traveling across the country uh, fishing against hammers on a Bassmaster open stage. So you're saying that griff's not a hammer? Not at all. Yeah, I would I would agree <laughs> with this. I mean, the results speak no shade, for themselves. Griff. No shade, right? man. No shade. So I think one of the interesting things about life is that you know, no matter what your plans may be, if you're open to the universe and just what it's laying out for you and giving you, you you may plan to go here, but life has this funny way of kind of course correcting you, right? And if you're kind right. of open to it, if you're open to all these amazing experiences and learning new things and different techniques, and I, I can kind of see that in your like cool. journey over the last few years that yeah, maybe you were starting to go this direction, but just like a business owner or a parent or a, you know, a spouse or whatever, like you kind of have to be open to like, all right, well we plan to do this, but we're going to do this now because just of like fishing, you got to pivot. Right? 100%. Yep. And it's, it seems like you are kind of embracing those pivots and going different ways while staying true to who you are totally. as an angler. Is that a fair assessment? Absolutely. Okay. I've seen enough glimpses of these crazy ideas in my head coming close to like fruition, like five bites that I needed a day in the, the context of, of a big time tournament. And I just haven't had the execution yet. But if you, if you look at it from a step back, really I had 18 tournament days of fishing last season. I had a couple of phenomenal you know, days, but you need to string together two and three days in a row. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I got dealt pretty tough cards as far as conditions and uh, outlying factors, and I was still able to get reactions from the right fish. So coming that close and not executing the plan made me even hungrier. Yeah. But it, it's, it's a learning opportunity. A lot of that was new water. Uh, and to, to try to break down new water is one of the things that I enjoy most about what we do as anglers. And it started from you know a small regional level at my little local parks that you've been pounding uh, yep. a little bit yep. uh, in the LA and Orange County area. Man, what amazing fisheries. <laughs> <laughs> Way cooler than St. Lawrence River. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> but there's, there's real learning opportunities at all those levels that you can actually draw from and, and find success or create success, I feel. So that's all I'm trying to do is is trying to be a better angler by being a less terrible angler with each experience. And I mean, gosh, the first, first day of my tournament season last year, I was sitting in 20th place against 225, you know, hammers because my game plan was actually being executed. And I didn't do that on day two. And three or four other events I had the 10 to 15 bites that I was hoping for didn't execute. So, gosh, um, it, it reinvigorated me because I think the, the problem with fishing sometimes is when you're hyper-focused on whatever style of fishing it is, whether it's tournament fishing or trophy fishing, um, I would reach levels of burnout. Yeah. Right? I kind of sure. plateau, get bored with things. Like, I mean, there was a point where I bounced an 11 pounder and stared at it in disgust, and, and I was pissed because it wasn't bigger. And I was like, man, this is a bad place to be in my head right now. I need to just drop this. I'm going to go pan fishing for like a month and a half, and that's what I did. Yeah. It allowed me to reset, and, and continually just probing through this fishing world and all the opportunities it affords has allowed me to kind of redo that. Yeah. Again and again and again. Well, let's let me talk. I mean, I, I want to dive into, you know, some actual technique stuff and mindset yep. stuff. But since you brought something up, let's let's dive down a rabbit hole for a minute. So you talked about execution, mm -hmm. right? So we talk about execution here a lot, mainly when we discuss it. It's it's from the standpoint of, you know, if a fish bites, you got to get it in the boat right? Or to your feet, right? So we talk yeah. about it in like, you know, hey, this rod will just help you land more fish or this sure. hook will help you land more fish, right? And, you know, a lot of our 
community is, uh, you know, our tournament anglers, but a lot of us are just fun fishermen too, right? Totally. So we don't necessarily always dissect, you know, execution maybe as much as a tournament angler has to, right? Like if I lose a fish, you know, between me and Griff, as long as we're not in a 1v1, I don't really care, right? But if you're in a tournament and you lose a fish, like that's a, that's a major thing. So what do you do when, you know, I mean, you just, you just said it, your execution, you know, sucked, right? For sure. So for sure. how do you, what do you, what do you do from there? How do you regroup? Do you, are you looking at the hooks? Are you looking at your rod? Are you looking at your approach at how you fought the fish at when you said that, like, what's the mindset on how to evaluate where you were mm -hmm. to improve it? How do we do that? Being observant and paying attention to every subtle detail. As fishermen, I feel like we get caught up in the moment and perceive things differently than how they may have actually occurred. But one of the biggest benefits of trying to document my own journey throughout all these years is the ability to actually step out of that first person perspective and watch myself, especially when I make mistakes. Like literally watching yourself literally, on your videos. Over and over, just like any other sports and yep. reviewing film and paying attention to mechanics, body movement, how I'm pulling, not pulling on that rod, winding through, not winding through, pausing for, for a moment, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's the beautiful thing about fishing. And the frustrating thing is like, everything does matter yeah. to a degree. And some things may seem inconsequential to others, but it could be the world of difference for sure. somebody else. And, and even managing emotions was a big thing because you get hyped up in the moment, man. Fishing was tough last year. So you get bit, it's like, oh crap, I'm bit. Then it's a good one. I mean, I, I lost a high five pounder at the last event at Grand Lake that cost me like three grand. Right. Like it was the difference between a check or not. So have you gone back to that game tape and watched oh, it? Oh, totally. I totally rushed that. Fish. And what, okay, so when I, your fault. Totally. Okay. A thousand percent my fault. Right. And it's just continuing to get better. It's, it's interesting what the human mind will do to itself. Yeah. Because you, you can practice, you can fun fish and, and fall back on those mechanics and those good habits. Yep. But then you insert some more adrenaline in the context of a big event or you're yeah. pushing against a, a buddy that you know you really want to beat and all of a sudden you're you're doing things out of your norm yeah and stepping out of pocket and i found myself in a couple of those situations because multi-day events too man i found myself exhausted both physically and mentally it's hard not to get excited to go fishing let alone on some place like the st lawrence river right Especially when you're on the right fish. Right, you're just a kid weeks. in a candy store. Totally, I mean, you're like, yeah. oh man, this is right. the one. Yeah. It's hard to force yourself to go to bed at a decent <laughs> time and wake up at three o'clock and start the process and to do that two days, hopefully three in a row. Yeah. I mean, big shout out to all the elite boys. I mean, four days. Well, it's, it's, that's brutal. It's discipline. Totally. And it's, you know, dude, we're all, we all come every day with a different set of discipline. Mm -hmm. And some of us need more time or less time or more experience or let, you know what I mean? Like yep. we all develop it differently, but these are things that as you get more and more seasoned that, you know, I mean, the learning boom, never one, stops. one season through, right? In, you already are like, okay, dude, I gotta have again. more discipline. Yeah. You know, there's, you can already identify some of these things. And the For game, sure. the game tape thing is, it's huge, dude. Huge. So when I was guiding fly fishing, uh, a buddy of mine that really kind of taught me how to fly fish, his name was Hutch Hutchinson, big, big Orvis dude, right? Uh, one of the best fly casters and, and instructors in the world. He taught me the value of watching yourself on film, right? And back then, it was like the shittiest iPhone footage totally. ever, right? But it's so easy now to film everything that you do and we don't really talk about that much, but you know, as I was instructing, I could tell somebody over and over and over again, dude, you're breaking your wrist. Hey, you're breaking your wrist. And, and they would fight you. Like, right. dude, I'm not breaking my wrist. And then you film them and you say, okay, look. And they see themselves and be like, holy shit, I'm breaking my wrist, right? right? There's, you know, we don't all have the luxury of like just filming our day forever and then just re-watching it, but then again, we almost kind of do if we want to be serious Definitely about it. Definitely a lot it. easier in 2022 than it was in 2006 when I first tried. 100%. So, you know, sometimes <laughs> the way 
in my head to fix like execution things is to is to round table like me and Griff will have deep conversations and Jeff and I'll have a deep conversation. You and I will have deep conversations sure. like, okay, dude, this is happening. It's not working right. What do we do? And sometimes just like spitballing brings things to life. But, uh, you know, even if you're a shore fisherman or a pond fisherman, if something's not working right, maybe record yourself, totally. right? And then just kind of watch it back. And maybe you think you're setting the hook a certain way, but when you see it, it's different than mm -hmm. how it, it's playing in your mind to where you can fix some of that stuff. Trial and error is really the name of the game. If you're not willing to try something different, how will you know if that's worse or better than what you're currently doing? True. So that's yeah. where I find myself in trouble when I come into a dope tackle shop like this because I want to... You should try everything. I want to try here. everything. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about some baits that are tried and true for you. Like for sure. we, we all know you as a big bait guy. And, and dude, I don't want to say I want to pigeonhole you as that guy, but you did spend most of the season throwing big baits. We, we saw the photos. You talked about, you know, screw it. I went big, right? Mm -hmm. So let me, let me just pick your brain. Okay. a little bit on this stuff because you know dude a lot of us are still getting confidence in throwing baits like this right right so what is your mindset especially like going into a place that maybe isn't known for big baits right mm -hmm. like it's easy for a guy like me who's kind of like i'm not really a big bait guy like jeff right like if that's what i need to throw then I'll do it, but it's easier for me to be like, okay, they're stocking trout, they're gonna eat big stuff, I'm gonna throw a big bait, right? But when you're fishing a place where they're, everybody else is throwing a jig or a crankbait or mm -hmm. you know whatever, what's the mindset in going with a big bait versus a, a traditional size right. bait? Number one, I'm hoping to trigger some kind of positive response from the right fish. And a big fish is relative to whatever system you're fishing. Right throughout the whole southern band of, this, of the U.S., you're talking probably five to ten pound fish. Uh, it could be three to six pound fish in the Midwest or up in upstate New York. Uh, but there is definitely irrefutable results when you're throwing a big bait, whether you're catching them or not, on getting those right fish or that certain class of fish to show themselves and hopefully bite. So y you can hopefully hold that bad boy up and show it off sure. to the world or you yep. know, enjoy that moment for what it is. And they excel at that. I'm actually making a conscious effort and adjustment this year going into the season and actually doing it backwards from how I operated through nine events last year. And I spent the majority of my practice, unofficial or not, trying to figure out how to catch numbers of good fish that would put me in a good position uh, to hopefully make a big swing with one, two fish hopefully five obviously on a big bait but even one fish a day would make a world of difference in the results and i spent so much time on these tough fisheries just trying to get bit by keepers a lot of times and really relegated the big stuff for game days because i felt like well i know if i'm going to get bit by these fish i want them to happen on day one two and three of the tournament like it it at the time, I felt like it was inconsequential for me to throw them in practice. But in hindsight, I was able to quickly find the right fish once I actually went to the big bait, whether that was in practice or whether that was during the tournament, to where I, I had abandoned ship on all the traditional stuff because I was getting the engagement from fish that would have easily put me in the top 10 in three, four events. Like they're coming up, they're nipping at it, they're headbutting with their mouth closed. I mean, like infuriating stuff in a tournament situation. Right, but sure. at the same time, I'm getting the right fish to come up and engage with it. So I was like, man, like, am I really going to have a better chance beating 224 other amazing fishermen with a traditional bait? Or is utilizing a 6 to 11 inch bait my best bet to get the right five bites that I need to put myself... <clears throat> to put myself in a position to do what I want, which is win one of these things. Right. So the big bait was was huge for me. Uh, mostly hard baits, uh, occasionally so, a soft bait. So how do you, let's let's talk about that. I try. Okay. I literally pick it up, throw it, see if a fish comes up yep. and you know chases it or yep. bites it or not. Okay. And if they don't, 
I'm putting that thing down. I'm trying something different. Okay. Whether it's soft, whether it's a boot tail, whether it's side to side, whether it's a glide bait, whether it's a crank down, whether it's multi piece, whether right. it's up in the column, whether it's down so in the column. So you start somewhere. You have to start somewhere. And your confidence is going to dictate where your starting point is. So confidence and my experience built, you know, that built Right. That that's building the confidence. Right. Absolutely. So if you have neither, mm -hmm. right? And you don't have a lot of experience, you don't have confidence because you haven't really stuck a lot of big bait fish, right? right. It, we we tend to pigeonhole, I would say, both a glide bait and a soft bait mm -hmm. as like times of the year baits or water temperature baits, right? I see that often and I've never agreed with any of that. Great. So you don't think of this as a warmer weather thing and this is a colder weather thing. <laughs> it's it's not how it what goes through your mind. I once got a text from Justin Pirelli, shout out to my uh, Northeast crew. I was like, hey, do um, you ever get bit throwing an ice slide in 37 degree water? I'm like, dude, I've never even seen 37 degree water. Like, <laughs> right, right. But he actually found success. Right. Uh, fishing in, in a, a very adverse condition with a bait that I had no experience with, but he was willing to try. Yep and uh, put in the time and the effort. And unfortunately, I mean, Jeffrey can, can attest to it, there's really no shortcut. You gotta go out there and spend the time, uh, work on that on, on that craft if that's what you wanna see success with. There's, right. there's really no no easy shortcut. So you pick one. Pick one. You gotta one. start there. If this isn't working, then try this just out totally. of, you know, you gotta and, try something different, and, right? And there's a lot of great info out there by a lot of accomplished anglers that have a body of work that you can reference. Yep. And I'm not talking about myself, I'm just talking about overall, like yep. what's available to to the audience these days. It's pretty incredible. Just do yourself a favor as a consumer of this content and just you know see understand the context of what they're doing, uh, the frequency, uh, because the, you can go out there and just blindly chuck a big bait anywhere and eventually you're gonna get a bite. But would you be able to duplicate it? Right. That's where I see a lot of issues with new anglers. Uh, they, they don't really have a strategy to try to duplicate that or improve on it. Sure. Well, when you when you go to a big bait, mm -hmm. okay, and Start so, smaller, number one. Right? Okay. There, there's smaller versions of both those baits so all over these let's, walls. Let's take this, for instance. Here, mm -hmm. you hold this. Yep. All right, so let's talk about ice slides since, yeah. since I'm holding it. So 262, mm -hmm. and, and I, I pulled this one because it's the biggest ice slide that Mega Bass does. That's a big bait. And it's one that you've made a ton of money on. Yep. You've, you've done incredibly well on this bait. I've actually not sucked in tournaments a couple times. Right. <laughs> this was a while ago, though. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. But, you know, you got to remember those glory fast. days, right? There's a 185. Yep. Right? There's a 135. Mm -hmm. So, you know, general theory is the bigger the bait, the more the draw power, totally. right? So like you throw the big one and the fish gravitate to it. As you go down in size, you don't have the same draw power. Do you- But your engagement rate goes up. Okay. And down as you scale your lure presentation. Because okay. fundamentally and mechanically, these are all glide baits. Right. Right, so to a degree, they all function in a similar fashion. So the, the lessons you can learn on the smaller side through higher engagement levels, mm -hmm even though they're smaller fish, translate when you step up to the big bait. So you can go from 20 to 30 fish on a fun day with a 135. Right. Step up to the 185, see the numbers diminish, but your, your quality's probably gonna go up. You can catch two to, to eight pound fish pretty well with a mid-sized glide bait like this. And learn, especially when the, the stakes aren't as high, when those two to four pounders are bouncing off or you're swinging on those, Bites because you're excited and you're, you're trying to boat flip them or whatever the mistake that you're, you're going You're teaching yourself to the mechanics that you're going to need for this one. Absolutely, because when you do step up to a big bait that you're appealing to the very you know small like percentage of higher echelon size fish. Yep. It's you're hopefully not going to make those mistakes when it would haunt you the most. Right. When it's an eight, ten, and bigger. Right. Well, and if you lose it, they were all bigger. Oh, every time. Yeah, they're every all 12s. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So talk to me, since we have these in our hands, mm -hmm. talk to me about some basic mechanics of these things. So for sure. And this our, takes it even a step further back, back to the traditional world. Okay. And understanding cadence, uh, suspending factors, uh, back to the jerk baits. I feel like guys like uh, Justin Pirelli, who is yep. well-versed in jerkbait fishing, picked up the glide bait like that. 
because they understood a lot of those concepts and nuances and, and understanding that you can actually make a sinking eye slide even suspend with a simple adjustment is changing out the hooks and then fine tuning with all the accessories that you got here yeah but adding weight or and such so let's talk about that really fast okay. right because I, I want people to be able to take something tangible away for sure and, and implement it right yep so you know we we have such a way as Americans to just want to buy something and tie it on and use it right Dude. and it's 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 f almost comical like we we kind of joke about it a lot that you know we outsell a floating version with a sinking version like 20 to 1 because people just want to buy it and use it and if it doesn't work they'll just cut it off and not worry about it right whereas oftentimes a floating version has so much more versatility if you're just going to just like add this or tweak this or right For sure i mean so, that bait in particular the 185 comes in a sinking model with the core right core list right of colors right then you got the whole jdm lineup that come with feathered treble hooks but they float and that allows you the ability to adjust that that um, position in the water column to either float or suspend right and become truly neutral and there are times especially when those fish are lethargic or target uh, oriented where you want a, a long rate of, of pause as part of your presentation and that could be the difference yeah but similar to a jerk bait right mm -hmm. even though a bait like this may be tuned and built to sink or a bait like a you know a, an Edo Vision 110 may be tuned to suspend they're at a highly sophisticated tune at a very specific water temperature right right so i can't tell you how many people maybe start with a 185 because it's a more approachable size Absolutely. than say a 262 and they buy a sinking and they throw it out there and the thing floats like a cork right and they're complaining and they're like well it, it floats it doesn't work well no it <laughs> it floats because the water temperature is different than what it's actually tuned Science. to why aren't you guys paying atten attention in class man i mean come on but there's so many things we can do right totally. i mean we can we can so you mentioned hooks so you can adjust the hook. So if you want it to sink a little bit quicker, you can go up in size. Mm -hmm. If you want it to float a little higher, you can go down in size. Correct. We can add strips. They make floating and weighted strips now. Right, right? totally. Um, any other? Your line. Okay. Your line's a big part of that presentation. Braid, I feel, has almost a neutral density. Uh, monofilament tends to have a, a little bit more floatiness to it than, than fluorocarbon does, for sure. So the, the line you have tied on to this lure is gonna affect how you're presenting it. And you can use that to your advantage. But so I'm going to Florida, I'm fishing shallow most of the time. Yep. Less than 10 feet, most likely 95% of the time. Right. So I'm also gonna probably be fishing in and around a lot of submerged vegetation. So I actually wanna keep that bait up, out of the grass, in a strike zone, not fouled with you know pieces of flat, floating hydrilla or whatever. Sure. So I actually want these baits to stay up. So I'm not gonna be fishing a glide bait on fluorocarbon. I'll probably be throwing it on a braid to, to, to fluorocarbon leader, just to kind of keep it up. And I'm going to want to tie on my floaters and my baits that ride heavier up in the column in that circumstance. Yep. And then it's the opposite when I come home to the West Coast where I often find myself fishing in 12 to 25 feet. And I'll throw fluorocarbon because over the length of a long cast, that's helping pull this bait down into the zone. Like I can easily fish these baits down 15, 20, 25 feet. Okay. With a little bit of patience. And speaking of these baits specifically, and I know there's a million glides. I know this mm -hmm. isn't the only glide you throw, right? Like I right. mean, we were talking about, you know, the jointed claw and you've got the eye slide and there's, there's tons of different baits that we can implement into our arsenal, right? Oh yeah. When you're fishing a bait like this, whether it's a 185, 262, are you wanting to make sure that this thing is always doing a glide? Like, is this going through your head? Or are, do you want it to be erratic? Or what? what is the movement that you're after? Or is that changing too, based on where you are? Yeah, those are all great questions and they all have a yes or no answer. Okay. And, and really you have to be willing to experiment because the glide bait is a phenomenal lure choice because it's got so much versatility. You could do so much with it. You can even dead stick them with these floaters that we're talking about. And I've caught fish doing that, literally just throwing it out, letting it just sit there, not moving it. You come up and eat it. The ability to adjust your presentation is its 
strongest feature. So experiment with it at all times. When I've had the, the benefit of living some of my best big bait and big fish flurries, I mean, gosh, most of the people are familiar with the 2012 run from Big Bass Dreams Volume 1. I hammered those big fish for seven weeks straight. And re I mean, gosh, I've had a lot of big fish. I caught them differently every single day. Whether that was a different area, different lure style, different presentation, different retrieve. So that taught me to be hyper open to experimentation, literally on an hourly or moment by moment basis, let alone daily. And you could see in that old school video, all my buddies were playing net B most of the time because they were already too far behind. They were chasing what they had seen me do even earlier that day or the day before. And I'm like, bro, they're already off that. And I'm allowing the fish to dictate what I'm doing. Okay. So is there a time that you throw a bit like this and just wind it in? Oh, a thousand percent. Is there a time when, when they're you not throw... responding to the other retrieves? Okay. So is there a time that you throw this out there and you want it to just kick left and right? Oh yeah. Is there a time where maybe you're just jerking it like a jerk bait and it's just going wherever the fuck it wants to go? A thousand percent. So there's not a right or a wrong nope. unless the fish are telling us there's a right or a wrong. Totally. So it's, it's up to us. Listen to the fish. To experiment, mm -hmm. try things. Now, how are the fish speaking to us? They're not biting it, so it's wrong. They're following it, but not eating it, so it's wrong. How are we listening to them? Yeah, yeah, I'm looking for positive engagement, okay. right? And there's levels to that. Obviously, the best is when they just completely maul it and right. hook themselves. Then you like know it's up. right. It's like, man, yeah. okay, I'm gonna keep doing this until that stops working. Okay. And because conditions are always changing. Okay. By the moment. Sun's changing position in, in the sky. Cloud cover is coming in or out or not. Wind is picking up or not. Uh, just, you know, sediments blowing. I mean, you name it. The, the conditions are continually flux. So you gotta make sure you're open to change. And, and it's tough because like when do you when you put something down and when do you not? You, right. You, you have to build that gut instinct through experience. Right. And, and really, how how did I do it? I threw nothing but a big bait for like eight years straight. Yeah. You thought you had it bad. I mean, year round, like like nonstop because right. I was hyper focused at that time in my life to catching the one, and I wanted to to try things that nobody talked about because obviously they don't eat big baits in the summer or that lake doesn't get trout so they're not going to eat it there. Right. Okay. And you wanted to prove that wrong. I wanted to test it. Yep. And see for myself. Okay. And have my, a mind of my own. Honestly. Right. And then through those experiences, you've developed your own opinions on that. Totally. Right. Based on real life experience. Right. Not something I read or heard about, something that I saw that with you my tried. own eyes. Yeah. yeah. So the same that we talked about as far as like you know, jerking, swimming, moving, cadence, right? Does the same rule apply to like, when do you throw a joint a claw? When mm -hmm. do you throw an ice slide? When do you throw a slide swimmer? Is the same thing happening? Like you have to start somewhere and then if- That's where I get in trouble. Okay. Right, and you get three days of official practice in these tournaments, for example, two and a half days really. <laughs> and luckily it's open-ended. You can practice as, you want, as much as you want prior. And even when I get there early, like a week or two weeks, it's not enough time to go through all the options. Like I'm running out of time because number one, I got to find the fish first just to actually have someone to ask a question to. Yeah. And then I'm going through like the, the entire tackle box and trying to figure out the best option to, to catch the fish that I'm looking for. And even as an angler who fishes full time, um, gosh, there's not enough time to do it all. Yeah. So you kind of, I, I envy the guys that really hyper focused on certain lure presentations. And they've got like one to like six rods on the deck. Right. I'm like, dang, that's gotta be so much like less stressful at times. Yeah. It's like, they're either gonna bite this jig or they're not. And they're gonna adjust themselves with their jig to what they have to do. Right. If they can. Right. Right. Totally. But, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you go back in history, through some of the, the great anglers. I mean, you know, like David Fritz comes to mind, for instance. Totally. Dude, I, I don't know David Fritz. I'm sure that guy, that guy could probably catch him on anything, but we know him as a crankbait guy. Oh, for sure. And that's obviously what his, you know, confidence bait was, right? Mm -hmm. So you could take a guy like that that will just take a crankbait and he will just tear things apart until he finds his lane, right? right. So I've, I've pretty much done that with all these different big baits over the years. Okay. And and put in that time to, to, to try to, piece together like okay 
in this situation, I got that bait to work. Like I've caught them good in clear water, smallmouth fishing with that. Okay. Like that's cool. But I've also caught them in really dirty water fishing largemouth with that. Right. So it's like, mm, okay, and you're kind of back to, to, to that question of like, where do you start? You just got to start. Okay. So if you're a guy just fishing from a shore, for yeah. instance, and you just want to catch the biggest fish in the pond, mm -hmm. right? Do you, where do you start? I'm going to go with uh, something that either matches the hatch. Okay. Uh, and mimicking a, a large forage base, okay. whatever that is. Or I'm going to go the other way and go with something bright and gouty. Okay. Just to trigger a response, hopefully. Okay. Um, that's usually where I start. And I'm going to start shallow and work my way deeper. Okay. So I feel like some, when those shallow fish are up, they're active, they're easier to catch. You can find a fun bite quickly. So let's talk about matching the hatch. Mm -hmm. Is color important to you? It is the smaller the bait is. Okay. I feel like the larger you go, it becomes less of a factor. Okay. But yes, it can be a factor. Okay. So when you're matching, let's say you're fishing a, a place where they're feeding on bluegill, mm -hmm. right? Are, this doesn't look like a bluegill. No. But are you going to a bluegill shade or a bluegill shape or a bluegill movement or what? What are you trying to match? Right. That's a tough question. Uh, I'm going to go with the shape first. Okay. The colors are easy. I mean, there's so many cool options now. I've got. All you guys that are new to fishing in the last three to five years, even you know more recently, you guys don't know how good you have it. There's a lot of amazing colors. Oh my colors. gosh, yeah. there's so much cool stuff now. Like yeah. you go back 10, 15, 20 years, like the options were so limited and they did very little, but you know, it's kind of what we had to work with. And now you have the option of finding hyper-realistic baits with profiles and paint, paint finishes. Like that's an easy one to, to scratch off the confidence list large mouth and smallies are going to eat sunfish everywhere and uh, i mean honestly i was looking at that bait sanity i got gill and i've yep. got one in the basket yep like they're it's hard that. not to yeah they're going to eat that thing. right and even and i so i picked one natural looking color yeah and i picked that bone color right which is like, silly so i gravitated to that to the raw right which okay. is the bone color yep because I'm a sucker for bone. Everywhere I've ever gone, I've, I, I, I catch them on bone. But yeah. there's nothing in the water that looks like bone. I so, mean, I guess it's a shad color because it's the closest thing I can think of. Mm -hmm. But I, it doesn't matter if it's in a bluegill profile right. or in a in a crawfish. On, I mean, so there's certain colors that that show us that maybe it doesn't matter. I mean, white is an underrated color all the way around. Um, so is black. Uh, and then if you go back to the old hand pour days when guys were, you know, making soft baits out of their garages. Like, dude, those colors are terrible. Right. And it didn't matter. And they still ate it. They ate the crap out of yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So Jeff and I get in this arguments a lot because Jeff thinks color doesn't matter at all. But he does think it matters. He just <laughs> likes to sound like it doesn't matter. I think, I think color is maybe the least important of all the aspects, but I think when it matters, it's critically important. I think you nailed it right on the head. Because if, if your mechanics, your presentation are off, the color is not going to matter. It doesn't make a difference. It's not like they're just going to magically eat that right. color. But if you have all of those things dialed in, now you might be able to see more positive response with a certain color. So speaking of response, you have fish following your bait, mm -hmm. right? So let's say they're following it, but they're not giving you the positive response. They're not actually eating it, mm -hmm. right? How are you taking the information they're giving you and applying it are you changing your angles are you changing your cadence are you changing your colors yes okay all of so, that so the first thing i do i'm going to change cadence okay every time i'm going to try to pull it away from it okay and trigger just a response uh creating a sense of urgency is important i want them to feel like i better go take my shot now or it's out of here okay uh, that's worked out for me way better than like dead killing it, it and, and watching that fish do nothing and slowly sink out right because that's what's probably going to happen. Yeah. Next is I'm going to try a different approach, but I've learned to be a little bit more patient as well. Kind of leave that area or that fish, come back from a different approach, or wait for conditions to change. And I mean, gosh, I almost caught a seven or eight pound largemouth at Smith Lake. That would have definitely helped me um, by doing that. I found this fish on first day of competition, came up on uh, Clash Nine actually, gliding it, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like. People aren't even talking about this class of fish on this fishery. Dude, it took nine pounds a day to break the top 10. Right. Yeah, you could have almost done it with one fish. 
Right. And that was the kind of thing I was discovering during the tournament. And I was getting him to eat these baits, and that big one wouldn't commit. So I came back to that thing twice on day one. Obviously, I went straight to her on day three, hoping low light because we had a fog delay. That played a factor. Um, and sure enough, first cast on, on where I found this fish, she came up and she's nosing it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not eating it. Kept adjusting. Uh, and I, I, I went super technical, adjusting the, the weights uh, on the bait, tail position, pulling the lip out, you know, you name it. You can do all kinds of stuff with yep. that bait. Finally came back midday, like the third time that day and fish it erratically just trying to trigger response and the fish comes up in my cone layer and I watch this thing just smack it and not get the hooks. Mm. I'm just like, oh my gosh. And I just ran out of time. Yeah. I ran out of time and, this and is, options. And this is what happens. Yeah. I and, mean, and it happens more, I mean, there's more heartache in big bait fishing. Oh, for sure. Than you, in traditional gotta, fishing. You gotta embrace the suck. Right. You're going to suck. Yeah. But when you don't suck, it's the some of the coolest things you can experience in fishing. 100%, yeah. For sure. Well, let's, I mean, I think we covered the majority of how we're making decisions, mm -hmm. right? But let's talk about a soft bait real quick, like a mag draft. Because I, yep. I know you you throw a paddle tail a yeah. lot. and Caught you Caught a ton of fish on that bait. On the mag draft. What are we doing differently with this? Is it always just cast and retrieve? Is there sweet speeds? Are we yeah. doing different stuff? Talk to me about the approach on a mag draft. To me, that's that's a sweet spot style of bait. Okay. It swims the best at whatever retrieve speed or pace you you can you can feel. It yeah. When it's swimming right, and you only really come to understand that as you start getting bites and fish are eating it, and become and paying attention to what that feels like. Right. Or, or actually watching it visually too. You can see that thing shimmy or sashay or oscillate as the, every time that boot you know kicks back and forth. But then you start to develop this sweet spot feel, and it's like, oh man, okay, that's that's the speed I want, because it's putting out the right vibration or displacement or whatever it is that's triggering these sure. fish. Uh, and once you can kind of dial that in, that becomes a pretty easy bait to fish. I would agree with that. And yeah. and, and each size is going to have a different sweet spot. Oh, for sure. Right. So you're not you're not taking a bait like this that's got a built-in speed really mm -hmm. that it needs to be. You're not taking this and necessarily tweaking it and altering it as much as you are a glide bait. No. You're no. kind of just using this as the tool it was built for and In most cases, letting it do yeah. what it's supposed the to do. The biggest thing I'll really do to it is cut that out and rig it weedless with okay. like one of those new BKK hooks with those like 12, 14 knot sizes. Yep. Just now because it allows me to present the bait in different areas than I could with an open hanging treble. Okay. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to want that treble when I can get away with it. Sure. So, uh, other than that, you know, breaking up that steady uh, retrieve can be a trigger at times. Okay. Um, but I'm not like I'm trying to make that thing glide or do anything super crazy underwater. Right. I mean, the fun part about that bait is when they're eating it, dude, they're eating it. Sure. And all you got to do is find that sweet spot. Yeah. For the most part, they're going to come to it. So, same thing here. You've got a, a six inch, an eight inch, and a 10 inch. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a five inch right. that very rarely comes around, mm -hmm. right? Are you, is it the same mindset and idea as it is with the big bait, where the biggest one is gonna have the most draw power, but the smaller ones are gonna have the most bites, or is it different in the mag draft or paddle tail soft bait? You know, I have noticed something unique with the mag draft series, and that was when I was doing a lot of training sessions and finding incredible success with the 10 inch. Like incredible success, I mean, it was almost, tough to blink with that beta for a long stretch mm -hmm. but sometimes i get someone that wasn't capable of throwing a six ounce bait on their appropriate tackle for an entire day so it's like oh okay maybe i'll hand them a smaller option an eight inch this should be easier like they should get more engagement because i couldn't throw a six inch at the time and not catch like two to four pounders like right stop which can be a hindrance when you're trying to put somebody on a potential fish of a lifetime totally and watching real life results from the eight to the 10 gave me the confidence to not be afraid to throw the 10 because smaller fish even would swim by the eight to come eat the 10. Hmm. When yeah. they're both being presented in a similar area. Were, again were and again. most of these sessions West Coast? Most of that was in Texas. Okay, so Jeff and I talk about this a lot actually. So yeah. like Jeff loves the mag draft, I love the mag draft. I love the six and I love the 10. 
and the eight is mm -hmm. like a weird spot gotcha. for me. Same with Jeff. Like okay. Jeff smokes them on the 10. Yep. They don't eat the eight the same. But totally. then when you go like kind of mid, like if you go to like Tennessee and Kentucky and places where they like, it's just different. They smoke them on the eight inch. I smoked them on the eight inch the first time I came home after having those experiences. And I'm like, okay, so there, there goes that preconceived notion that I thought was based off of real life experience. Right. But every every fishery is its own micro habitat. Yeah. And those fish are unique in their own like fish eating culture. Yeah. So, so don't like, necessarily be afraid of throwing something that's, I mean, this is a big bait. I think the takeaway is don't be afraid to throw a really big bait anywhere. Got it. Yeah, like, this is going to have a draw power, and mm -hmm. fish will eat We've it. We've got three pounders on that 10-inch That's rig. what I was just going to ask mm -hmm. you. How big of a fish but could eat But typically five plus. Okay. Typically. Right. And then how big of a fish is going to eat an ice slide 262? S six plus. Okay. Really? Yeah. Yeah, most of the time it's six plus. So if you're fishing a pond, and the biggest fish in the pond is five pounds, mm. this or that may not be the best option. I mean, it could eat it, obviously, you know? But how do you know until you actually try well, it? This is a good. Mm. This is a good point as well. That's the thing. Right? I grew up on putting zone. Right. Or finesse fishing was the name of the game because fishing sucks there. Like it's hard to get a bite. So, being able to actually just swing freely because understanding like, well, if I'm gonna go out there and fish a spinning rod with a finesse worm and only get one to five bites, like, what am I really missing out on? I'm just gonna throw these big ass lures and see what happens. And my goodness, I discovered a whole population of big fish, five to eight pounders that I very rarely experience fishing traditional. Hmm. But I did, I was able to go out there and, and just experiment and try it and, and just see. And something great came from it. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there anything else that you think people need to know about, and we do, we've, we've, we've thrown a lot of stuff yeah, out there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think my biggest, the thing that bugs me the most is when people feel like the bait is their missing piece in their game okay it's probably the least important that they didn't the catch the fish day. because they didn't have the right bait correct okay i feel like that can be true in, in certain circumstances but over the course of an entire season um, or a lifetime like it's not it's never the bait so you think on any given day let's say you me jeff griff we're all we're all out at sawar for instance mm -hmm. right and Jeff's throwing a, a hinkle, and yep. you're throwing a, an eye slide, and I'm throwing a jointed claw, and Griff's throwing a, a slide swimmer. Okay. All right? You think any one of us could be the winner that day based on our approach and our timing and our mechanics versus the one of us that chose yeah, the Yeah, you're right not going to win because you're fishing that bait, or you're, gonna, you're fishing that bait specifically. Uh, that's not the determining factor. Okay. It's so the angler. On any given day, any of these. So, you know, I think a lot of times people have a tendency to so pigeonhole a swim bait and a big bait as, uh, you know, being the one and only tool that's going to get the job done. But yeah. it's the same. I mean, dude, nobody comes in and just buys one crankbait. Right. Right? Like, I wish there was one crankbait that we needed because I got like 47 boxes of crankbaits, <laughs> right? But I got a lot of boxes of crankbaits. There's days where they want a, a Deep X 300. Yep. There's days where they want, you know, a combat crank. Uh, yep. There's days they want an LC, right? It's the same here. You're just getting back to like, when do you throw this or when do you throw that? You have to start and then adjust as the fish are telling you, yeah. right? Same I think thing. that's where the really good guys excel. They mm -hmm. make those adjustments quicker and are able to adapt better than others. That I, That's what I did poorly Yeah. this past year. I mean, honestly, that was probably one of the toughest years of fishing in my adult life as far as like what I expected to do and what I ended up holding up. Mm. It's like, mm, okay, that didn't really pan out. Yeah. So I, I see a lot of room for opportunity there, but if anybody has been subjected to my terrible content, you'll see like truthfully, look at the deck of the boat. There is a lot of options because I'm always willing to ask, like, ask that question. Because it's it, being open-minded has been my greatest strength, I feel. Yeah. Being open-minded and then following that up with being observant and trying to make a, a, a real adjustment and allowing the results to, to dictate my next move. Cool. Like, it's really that simple. Yeah. Well, 
Dude, I wish you the best of luck this year. Thanks, man. You know what I mean? I'm excited for it. Dude, I, we're all excited to watch yeah. what goes down. I mean, it's it's cool that you guys get to travel together. For sure. And, you know, do something that so many of us are envious of, of, of you getting a chance to do. But it's <laughs> fun to watch the process. And it's fun to watch a process from maybe a different standpoint that's not the same just cookie cutter, you know, tournament guy. Yeah, being different has got me to this point in my life to allow me to do all this crazy stuff that yeah. I never thought was possible. Yeah. So I'm kind of going to ride with that theme. Right. Right, and just being different. I mean, that's that's actually a big part of me, my lore choices too. Like, I honestly will try to, like, see what the local big bait culture is and steer away from it. Yeah. And show those fish something Going opposite way. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny is that seems to be a theme of the really great anglers that come through here. And mm -hmm. it, it was a theme that really I never paid attention to until Kenta was in here. Uh, and, and he had the same conversation with Jeff and I that he just does the opposite of what everybody else is doing. Like, that's how he chooses. If everybody's throwing a drop shot, he goes to the biggest thing he can find. Totally. Right? And if everybody's throwing a big stuff, he goes to the smallest thing he can find. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, it's, it's so simple. Like, it makes so much sense, right? But yeah. it's hard, it's hard to force yourself to do it when, you know, you know, like, well, I'll just put a drop shot on it and go catch FOMO it. Was right, a Griff? It's you a love tough that. deal to, to get you over it. You love throwing a drop shot. Right, especially in, like, 90 feet I don't mind it. <laughs> I honestly don't. Like, I mean, I don't I mind anything if they're eating it. For but sure. If I ain't gonna catch anything, I'd rather I'd rather throw this. Yeah. Right. Yeah, totally. yeah. Well, dude, I appreciate you taking the time to come down. It's always good to catch up with you and and you know sharing insight on the stuff. Hopefully that was useful uh, to you guys. But if you guys have questions, drop them down below. I'll do my best to answer. If I don't know the answer, then uh, we'll we'll find the answer for you. But uh, Jeff can leave links to the products. We're gonna leave links to. Oliver's, you know, Instagram, your YouTube, uh, Riley as well, right? She's busy yep. with your dog over there. Let's let's follow along with these guys. You know, give them give them support. If you guys have questions, let me know, dude. Good luck. Thank you. Good brother. luck, Riley. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. All right, dude. Have an amazing year this year. We're excited Appreciate for it. you. Thanks for taking the time, Jeff. See you later, guy. I'm going to have a beer. Peace, my friends.